Hi folks, welcome to another edition of Pembroke Today. Uh, I'm Ed Thorne, Pembroke Town Administrator, and today our special guest is Anna Siri, uh, Council on Aging Director. Uh, so welcome Anna to the show and uh, welcome to Pembroke. Thank you. Uh, you've been with us now for how long? Four months. Four months. So, uh, so why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself, excluding the work history and, uh, you know, so the folks get to know a little bit about you. About me. About me and my interest in seniors um, and why I chose to switch to this field. Um, I've always been involved with senior citizens. I worked in a nursing home through high school and college. Um, when I was in high school and college, also my friends would babysit and I would get hired to take care of elders in their home. Um, it's always been an interest of mine. Um, I've had relatives live with me growing up, my grandmother, my aunt, and one of my grandfathers. Over the years, I took this woman, for lack of a better word, under my wing. Um, she didn't have any family, and she became part of our family. So she passed away in 2001 at the age of 96. Um, that was a void in my life after she passed away. And um, in my flying career, which we'll talk about a little bit more, some of my favorite passengers were what we called snowbirds. And um, elders have just been a big part of my life. Well, you know, while we're talking about some of your work history, I think one of the interesting things about um, your resume that was, uh, um, that came, you know, really across uh, very strongly to the, to the committee was uh, your long career in the airline industry. So as I, as I asked you before, I, what kind of, you must have some great stories about. The, I had a fabulous career. I flew for three decades, 31 years. Um, over that time, when my children were little, I did what we called turnarounds. I went out and came home the same day, generally down to Florida and back. Um, and then I worked when code share first went into effect in the 90s. I worked for a year and a half on Virgin Atlantic Airlines. I was the Delta representative. I was the Delta employee. And code sharing was when um, airlines sold tickets on other airlines. Now it happens all the time. They don't put representatives or what they called it was in the ambassador program. So that was a lot of fun, being able to work for somebody different and still have your own company. Um, I flew international out of JFK in the late 90s and then the last six years of my career. Um, kind of fulfilling some of my needs is in the 90s I flew to Moscow a lot. Wow. Um, at that time there was a lot of Moscow adoptions. Um, what I found really rewarding is these couples would get on the airplane with their new baby. They'd spent three or four weeks and they felt like they were home just getting on an American airline. Well, I worked for Delta Airlines but with American flight attendants and then you know just their comfort level there. And then they're in for the long haul of 10 or 11 hours of a flight with a child. And oftentimes these children were hard to settle. So I spent a lot of time holding babies back then and really enjoyed it. <laughs> I also did um, worked in Delta's charter program. So I did charter flying with both the Red Sox and the Patriots. Oh, great. Earlier in my career, we carried a lot more celebrities. Later in my career, um, with NetJets and all of the smaller airlines we didn't see a lot of celebrities. Wow. Any uh, flights that are 10 or 12 hours? Um, JFK to Narita is 14 hours. I did quite a bit of that when I went back to graduate school because I could get my t flying time in. When I went back to graduate school in 2010 I still flew full-time and I worked an internship and I went to school full time. So I, in two years, it was pretty intense. And Narita, we get paid by our hours. And so that was where I could accumulate the most hours in the least amount of time. Wow. So what is it like to be on a flight for 14 hours? Um, we get rest breaks. There's like little areas that, um, crew bunks they're called. JFK to Narita was a 747. So we have a whole bunk that's up above the tail of the airplane and I could usually rest out for about four hours when we would shift out the crews. And um, I loved it because when I was off my break, 
usually we were going over Alaska and for two hours or three hours I could look out the window and not see one living soul. It was just absolutely beautiful. Wow. So real fortunate. A lot of great views. Any, I uh, hate to bring it up, but any scary moments in all um, those years? I have been really fortunate in my career. Um, I did get caught in wind shear really bad once going into Washington, D.C. Um, when we got there, we went right to the hotel, and the next morning when I woke up, a lot of the city still didn't have any electricity. Um, the news was saying that they were 90 mile an hour winds, but when we were in the wind shear, it was um, probably my scariest moment because you could not tell how far you were off of the ground. You could hear the engines racing. Um, the ironic thing about that flight was that um, when we got to Washington, the pilots went one way to their layover. We went another way, so we never had the chance to talk with them. And the next week, I was with the same captain again, and I started asking him. I said, I think I flew with you last week. And he told me it was the most challenging landing he had ever had, and he had used every minute of his training. So, wow. yeah. Some, that is quite an experience. It's, well, uh, let's uh, now get to the uh, the heart of the matter, and that's uh, you uh, your your career that you started while you were still flying, and uh, your your goal in getting um, your master's degree because you got your bachelor's before you started flying, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and then uh, then you started working on your master's degree in uh, social work mm -hmm. at uh, Bridgewater State. Yes. So you want to let us know, tell us about that. I graduated with my undergraduate degree in human services in 1980. My intention was to get a MSW to work in the social work field. Um, I couldn't find a job. I had a friend that talked me into the airlines. I was going to do that until I found a job. You know, one thing leads to another. And then probably around 2008, I just felt like it's been a great career. I don't want to do it anymore. The fatigue factor of flying international, I was losing a night's sleep a week. And as fun as it was to be in all these great cities, it was exhausting. What can I do next? What do I want to do? And I always, you know, I sat and I thought about it. I talked to a career coach for a while. And elder care is where senior citizens, that's always where my interest was. I couldn't figure out how to shift my skill set from my undergraduate degree, of which I was so far away from, my customer service base and everything that I had developed over the years to get into a job that I wanted to do. So I decided to go back to school. I was lucky. I got into Bridgewater State and um, you know, just decided that I would knuckle down and go full time which was 60 credits in two years. I maintained my full-time flying status, and then I worked my first year a 16-hour internship, and my second year a 20-hour internship, and that's 16 and 20 hours a week. Mm -hmm. So look, tell us about the internships. Uh, you had two of them while you were at Bridgewater? Mm -hmm. Everything I did at Bridgewater, everything, if I could wrap any presentation, any paper, any debate, any anything, it was all how can I expose myself to something that relates to seniors. Also I chose that with my internship. So the first year my internship was at Linden Ponds mm -hmm. and then my second year <clears throat> internship was at Senior Behavioral Health which is now um, Beth Israel Deaconess Hospital in Plymouth and that's a 19 bed um, Jerry Psych Ward mostly dealing with um, dementia, behaviors mm -hmm. related to dementia. So what was your first in t internship at Linden Ponds all about? Linden Ponds is, as most folks know, is a large community <coughs> care retirement community. They have about 1,200 residents in independent living, and then they have a skilled nursing facility, which is both short-term and long-term care, as well as a memory care unit. I was in the independent living sector. I worked under the social work department. So the social work department was there just to deal with issues of aging as they arose. Um, they also did the screening when people first wanted to move in 
to make sure that the person met the level of independence, or if they didn't, what interventions could be put into place to help them maintain that level of independence. Also, in my internship, I was able to work in their intermissions program, which is their adult day program for people with memory loss and more increased needs. Um, I worked in their caregiver support group and um, the low vision group. Mm -hmm. So I had a lot of exposure in a lot of ways to the social work. So that was internship number one, insured, insured, internship number, number two. Number two was at Senior Behavioral Health. Um, most of the patients that came to us usually was at a crisis level. Um, it was a planned admission. Um, they had to be cleared medically because senior behavioral health is a behavior floor. They could have some medical issues, but that could not be the predominant thing. Generally, um, I'd say about 40 to 50 percent of the patients that came um, had been came from home and had not had any formal diagnosis of dementia. So we did a lot of family work, um, a lot of um, diagnosis. Mm -hmm. um, we have one um, geriatric psychiatrist there. He would usually do an MRI to kind of get a real good snapshot of the brain, do a lot of family history, and then sit down and you know talk with the family and the patient too if it was relevant on what's going on, what they can see in the future. Um, a lot of times there's some medications that can help address the behaviors. They never address the disease. Other dementias, the most common one we know is Alzheimer's, but then there's vascular dementia, um, Lewy body dementia, which um, can be post Parkinson's disease or run hand in hand with Parkinson's. Mm -hmm. um, and so different medications, depending on what part of the brain is affected, um, can help with some of the behaviors. Um, hmm. We would do, one of my roles would be to figure out discharge planning. So whether the person could go home and maybe with supportive services for home or whether, you know, they're more of the assisted living level or whether they need skilled nursing. So working with the family on that and then directing them to figure out what their payer source would be, whether they were paying for the services or whether they needed to look into mass health. Mm -hmm. So you had the internships while you were getting your master's. Okay, so now you got your master's. Now you're out there in the, the real world again, as you always have been your whole life. Um, so what was your uh, first position after uh, grad school? I was really fortunate. Um, as I graduated in May of 2012, Delta offered an enhanced retirement program, and Lyndon Ponds had a position open in social work. I had had such a successful internship there that I applied and was hired for that job. So then, instead of just being an intern, I was the social worker for three buildings, which encompassed about 500 people. Wow. The 500 people, most of them were still independent, so only they really only use social work services if something came up. And then some of the folks, as they were aging and if issues were rising, we would get in there, meet with them, you know, and try to figure out what you can do to maintain that level of support. So if it was somebody that, you know, needed more housekeeping, if somebody that needed somebody there, um, you know, when they were showering because they were a fall risk, um, you know, just whatever supportive services were necessary. Working with families too. One of the biggest things at both Linden Ponds and in the public that I saw that get elders into trouble is mismanagement of medication. Um, and it comes with just trying to figure out did I take my medicine or did I not take my medicine. So even organization of a weekly cassette, setting mm -hmm. up your pills once, looking at a calendar, and then that will help um, a lot of people would end up in the hospital because they either took too much medicine right. or not enough. Right. It gets more challenging as you get older. There are more pills for different things and all of that can have negative repercussions. So just somebody that did go to the hospital because they weren't taking their medicines right, there's a lot of interventions that you can put into place to help them and that can maintain that level of independence. 
I have that feeling when it's my one a day vitamins. You know, there you go. That take two or three or whatever. So. Exactly. So the the next position uh, that you had was at uh, in Plymouth. In Plymouth. So after I had been at Linden Ponds for about a year and a half, a position opened back up at Senior Behavioral Health, where my second internship was, and I really, as much as I had a great job at Linden Ponds. I really wanted the opportunity to work there again under Dr. Mendoza, learn more about dementia, and really own the position this time as opposed to have been an intern before. Mm -hmm. And the other piece was is when I graduated from school, I sat and I obtained my LCSW, which is a licensing test. I needed to work for two years under supervision to sit for my LICSW, which is a licensed independent mm -hmm. clinical social worker. And that was one of my goals, was to get that license. Um, so going over to senior behavioral health, I knew I'd still have the supervision I needed in order to, to do that job. But it also gave me the depth of knowledge that I really wanted to know more about Jerry Psych. So that's what you were doing when uh, you apply for the job in Pembroke? Exactly. I sat for my LI in November, and at that point I thought, okay, what else do I want to do? Um, it was a great job at the hospital. I, with two other employees, started a caregiver support group there. I did some speaking uh, um, on behalf of SBHC in the community. I just really kind of felt like I wanted more community work. I just wanted something a little bit broader. I happened to go to Indeed.com, saw the position for the Director of Council of Aging, hadn't ever really even thought about a Council of Aging, started to explore it a little bit, and thought this is something that might be a good fit for me. Well, obviously, um, the uh, search committee um, was very impressed by your interview, and I know the selectmen were, who were the you know, final uh, appointing authority. When, when you got the position in Pembroke, well, what were some of the first things that you observed and things that you felt like you, you needed to do right away? Well, I think the, the very first thing, I think change is really hard. So I needed to build some rapport with both the staff and the, the volunteers that were there. Um, you know, just the, so that things are going to change, but they can ch change is okay too. Whereas right. for most of us, you're replacing somebody that had been there thir almost thirty years. Right. right, and and I was very aware of that too, and so I didn't want to come in like a stormtrooper. But I also knew that I had a lot that I needed to learn. I started the job without any orientation, just kind of got right in there. My strengths were not in the administrative piece, so even just at the beginning with the payroll and the accounts receivable, right. all those systems in place, um, I found a lot of people at Town Hall were very helpful with me in guiding me in the beginning. So I had my learning curve too. I think that in some ways it was easy for me because having been in school recently, I could research what I needed to do. I could have the critical thinking to figure out, okay, this is what right. needs to be done and mm -hmm. get that done. So learning just the, all the pieces of um, being a director and running this business of the Council of Aging um, was a lot. That was, you know, my personal goals was to understand that and make that go as smoothly as possible. Um, and I just really needed to understand the roles and the duties of staff. You know, we have um, the transportation coordinator, um, there's two principal clerks, but I didn't really know exactly what they did, and you know, now I do. Um, how can we make some of this more efficient also? Um, and then just, I wanted to be available to the residents. I wanted to, you know, feel like people could approach me uh, maybe people that hadn't used the senior center or, or services of the Council of Aging, you know, kind of have an open door with them. Um, I really wanted to kind of look at the building and see what could be done about that. Mm -hmm. um, you know, maybe just some building improvements. Um, so I was assessing the um, building needs. I wanted to collaborate more with the board of directors. I know that they felt that this was very important and as an advisory board, I really wanted them mm -hmm. to be 
um, part of this, and I found them very helpful too. So you know, those were kind of the 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 initial thing was kind of sit back, look, see, but dig in and get things done. Right. So after being the wily veteran of four months now, <laughs> my next question is, uh, what are some of your uh, immediate goals or intermediate goals for the Cal Sun Aging? Um, right now, um, stacked on my desk is the formula grant, which is the big grant from the Executive Office of Elder Affairs. Mm -hmm. So really digging into that and finalizing that and getting that in. Um, I want to continue to build our outreach program, um, find out the needs of the community and build programming. I have worked with a couple of residents directly one-on-one -on -one, um, who, you know, have had needs and I find that I really dip into that social work aspect of me um, to initiate the conversations and work with them. Mm -hmm. I would like to collaborate more with both the fire department and the police department to figure out how when there is some sort of emergency, whether it's a long time um, electro electricity being out mm -hmm. or something, who <coughs> who is our vulnerable um, population, who may need us to reach out, who might be running um, equipment in their home that they're dependent upon for medical needs. Also, a concern of mine having worked in the hospital is caregiver burden and caregiver support. And I know there's a lot of caregivers in the community and what happens if something happens to the caregiver? What happens to the person that they're caring for, especially if it's an emergency situation? I really hope that we can figure out who those folks are so we can make that transition really easy if the caregiver goes to the hospital. Um, so I'd like to build a little bit of contact information. Um, I would like to increase- While we're on the emergency oh. management uh, theme, um, one of the shows that I've had, I've had the emergency management directors, co-directors on, Rick Wall, police chief, and, and Mike Hill, who was then deputy, fire chief and now interim fire chief. And I think one of the interesting things about Pembroke is that our emergency management team is made up not just of fire and police, but yourself is included on the team, um, the library director, and the uh, health agent, uh, some members of my staff. And I think what we found out from Snowstorm Nemo a couple of mm. years ago is that the center of town is probably the first part of Pembroke that gets electricity back. And we found out that the library and the council on aging, who are in the middle of the town, you know, are, are ideal uh, shelters, warming centers on mm -hmm. the council, for the council on aging, uh, an emergency uh, shelter for, you know, for the library itself. And so that, that makes you and Debbie Wall and Sabrina, my executive assistant, much more parts of a, an integral part of the uh, emergency management team than just your normal fire and police. I've heard some great stories too from um, using the um, COA for the shelter. I think it was in the Nemo storm. Right. Um, the residents are, that are around that come in and talk about it. They talk about it really fondly. They enjoyed their time there as long, you know, it was long and drawn out. Right. But they, um, there was a lot of camaraderie. Yeah, we learned a big lesson from that storm, as a lot of communities did. Uh, we found out that. Uh, Habermach Elementary uh, wasn't as conducive for people staying overnight uh, in being in the gymnasium as opposed to the library. And another thing we found out about emergency management, uh, and it's a recent trend in the last several years, is that people are not going to leave their homes and, and, and leave their pets there. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. if you have an emergency shelter, <clears throat> you better have a place to put the pets. Mm -hmm. And we found out the library was a, an excellent situation because we could use the one meeting room as the pet shelter. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. so you know, we're we're really pleased that uh, the council on aging and the library are an integral part of our emergency management team. And and when you bring up pets, it brings me back to another thought that when I'm trying to develop who the caregivers are, um, what happens if somebody has a pet and they live alone? So that information would be really good for us to be able to have, so that if the police went or the fire department went to their house and they were taking somebody out that lived alone in an ambulance, if they could look at a database that says pet and house, call this person to mm -hmm. care for pet, 
um, you know, it is important. Pets are really important. I think sometimes our seniors won't go to the hospital because they're afraid of what will happen to their pet. Right. Uh, they don't want to leave them to go to a shelter in an um, emergency. Mm -hmm. So, you know, those are the things that we can address, I think, over time that will enhance the lives of people and give them a little bit of a level of comfort. It may not be an ideal situation that if they have to identify one of the, um, you know, a veterinarian or one of the other places to take their pets, but it's important. Mm -hmm. So are we done with the intermediate goals? Oh no, I have a, a bunch <laughs> more. Keep I, going. Want, I want to increase our transportation <clears throat> program. Um, you know, ha have more residents use it. It's you know they can call up for a ride to go to the bank and then back home um, here within town. So I really would like to increase our transportation program. I want to expand the intergenerational program, and um, you know be available. Mm -hmm. Well. Is our time winding down? We got a little bit of time. So. Okay. Shall we go on to long range goals? Absolutely. All right. Um, to increase the membership and the usage of the senior center as well as, you know, just services that are offered by the Council on Aging. Um, I really would like to do something with memory care, um, whether it be a memory cafe or um, a memory um, drop in group. And then I think we need to develop a strategic plan looking to the future. I'm going to throw out a couple of statistics at you. Um, in 2003, over age 65, the population, or 65 and over, was 35.9 million people. In 2013, it had risen to 44.7 million people. The projection for 2060, so for those folks who are 40 years old now, when they're 85, they are going to be 98 million folks. And then for the 85 plus population, it is expected to triple from 2013 at 14.6 million to tw in 2040, they're looking at, I'm sorry, in 2013 we have 6 million 85 plus population. Um, we are going to triple by 240 to 14.6 million. So we really need to be looking forward to our services and what we're offering, you know, just for the generations there now mm -hmm. and the generations coming up. Well, what do we have in line for, you were talking about transportation and very briefly, I think I'm gonna to have to have a sh another show about this, but we've been talking at Gatra, mm -hmm. uh, the Greater Attleboro uh, Taunton Regional mm -hmm. Transit Authority um, about a fixed bus route that we hope will serve the seniors in our community. As well as, actually that will serve everybody, so that's a flag stop. They're going to go from point A to B and back and forth and, and along the route you can flag it down. However, for our seniors and for the handicapped, we still will have the GATRA funded COA vans. Um, to meet the needs. Uh, most of the people at flag stops will have to be able to ambulate independently in distances. Mm -hmm. Well, let's see now. We uh, you've touched on a bunch of things and I think that there are several others that you know we're going to want to chat with you about and to let everybody know that uh, Anna's going to be hosting her own uh, program, um, you know, on PAC TV here. So mm -hmm. we're looking forward uh, to sharing some of those things with uh, um, your, your insight into the Council on Aging, you know, with the public in general. So um, we uh, have thoroughly enjoyed having you come aboard as our team. I know that we're very proud of our uh, community in Pembroke and we're very proud of the management team that we have with all of the department heads. So mm -hmm. uh, I know everybody's been really uh, receptive to having you come aboard mm -hmm. as a team and we're very pleased that you've chosen to join us. And so we're just, um, we're just delighted that the Council on Aging is, is moving forward with some of the things that you, mm -hmm. you, know, you envisioned uh, yeah. for us to, uh, to be dealing with. So. Yeah. Thank you. I feel um, very welcomed. I have had, as I said before, a lot of support from Town Hall and um, the residents, the volunteers, and the staff. It's been great.
All right. Well, ladies and gentlemen, that's the latest version of Pembroke Today. And uh, my special thanks to Anna Siri, our new Council on Aging Director. And uh, we're looking forward to uh, seeing you folks soon. Have a good time.